Hi, I'm Jonathan Gorard of Cambridge University and Wolfram Research, and I'll be talking about automated theorem proving and axiomatic mathematics. So kind of giving a, a, an introduction to the, the current status of our uh, functionality for automating pure mathematics in version 12 and a sort of quick look at things to come in, in version 12.1 and beyond. So the plan, the plan is to give a very brief overview of our current uh, automated theorem proving functionality and, and the functionality for doing axiomatic representation of pure mathematics in version 12 and, uh, and, and to give a, a brief glimpse of, of things to come in version 12.1 and, and beyond. Um, okay, so let me start by saying, so with most computer algebra systems, including for a long time the Wolfram language, uh, th there's very much an emphasis on doing kind of forward computation where you, you give some explicit calculation. You say, you know, evaluate this integral, solve this differential equation, factorize this quadratic, whatever, and you get back the result. And for many branches of applied mathematics and theoretical physics and so on, that's extremely useful because people are interested in doing uh, explicit calculations. But in pure mathematics, this sort of the, the, the the use case of that has been much less clear because pure mathematicians in general are interested not so much in doing calculations but improving theorems, which is sort of the, the inverse problem of this. And like most inverse problems, it turns out to be many orders of magnitude more difficult than the forward problem. So there are, there are several reasons for that. Um, one of which is, is kind of algorithmic. We know that there are a bunch of these uh, limitative results from mathematical logic and theoretical computer science like Gödel's first incompleteness theorem, Tarski's theorem on the undefinability of the truth predicate, Turing's theorems on undecidability of the, the Holting problem and the Entscheidungs problem and so on. There's, there's also a more kind of philosophical or conceptual difficulty, which is that it's not entirely clear what a proof should be. I mean, there are kind of two mutually con contradictory de uh, sort of objectives of proving something. One is, one is kind of epistemological to sort of convince you that a theorem is true, uh, and the other is more pedagogical to kind of explain why it's true. And to a certain extent, those are opposed because you know, the, the, the more convincing a proof is, the more formal it is, the more computable it is, in general, the less comprehensible it is. So we want to have something that kind of makes the balance between uh, automated proof verification uh, and, and sort of being as close to something that the Wolfram language can just automatically verify as possible whilst also maintaining some degree of comprehensibility. And there's also a more data curation oriented problem, which is in order for this to be useful for actual pure mathematics, you need to have not just very good theorem proving algorithms, but you also need to know a lot about math. You need to have you know, a, a very large collection of, uh, of uh, a, 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 or a large uh, curated corpus of mathematical information. And so there's a whole side to the company, which I'm not gonna talk so much about today, which is the, the semantic representations project, where in effect, we're trying to take the sort of roughly five million or so theorems that exist in the published literature of mathematics and the many more millions of kind of objects and definitions and acts that they're based upon and get them to the point where they can be, they're formal and computable and kind of can be fed directly into our theorem proving pipeline. And I'll mention that a little bit today, but it's not, not, not so much the emphasis of this talk. Um, but okay, let me start at the beginning. So um, for a long time, the Wolfram language has had kind of subterranean theorem proving functionality behind functions like full simplify and reduce. But much more recently in version 11.3, we released the first sort of serious theorem proving function, which is this thing called find equational proof. Uh, which is, so it, it proves arbitrary theorems in what's called first order equational logic, which is a restriction of first order logic in which one has only universal quantifiers and in which equality is the only built in predicate. And that's a, a significant restriction, but it still turns out to be sufficient to encode effectively any algebraic theory. So if you want to do group theory, ring theory, loop theory, uh, certain parts of field theory, universal algebra, Boolean logic, anything like that, you know, find equational proof can do that. So in its simplest case, it takes essentially the same syntax as full simplify. You give it a, a statement you want to prove, like A equals C, and a list of assumptions from which to prove it, A equals B, B equals C. So let's prove a really trivial theorem that kind of is representing a transitivity of the equality predicate here. So we get back this, this very simple proof object that's telling us, actually, that's kind of small. I'm not sure if we can make that any bigger. Possibly not. I'm already quite zoomed in. Um, that's telling us that we have five steps in that proof object. And uh, if we can get back this, this sort of graphical representation of the proof. So you see we start with these two axioms up here. We're trying to prove this hypothesis A equals C is actually true. In the process of doing that, we proved some intermediate substitution lemma. That's not a very interesting example. Okay, here's a slightly more interesting example. Here we're gonna define some axioms of group theory. Here are sort of symbolic representations of associativity, uh, right identity, and right inverse. And we're gonna prove that from that, the, the, the property of, of, of left identity also holds, which is a somewhat non-trivial uh, derivation. Okay, so we get, the, we get the result back. This time it's telling us that there were 11 steps in that proof. It's a slightly more complicated proof object. I can request back a data set version of, the, uh, of, of this proof. Oops, sorry, shouldn't press right. Uh, and I'm gonna say that the, the, the multiplication operator, which we chose to be G, I'm gonna typeset that using a center dot. And we get back this thing called the proof data set, which has, uh, the, so we have the axioms of group theory at the top, we have the hypothesis that we're trying to prove, and then for each of these intermediate lemmas, we can, go, we can drill down and we can see exactly how that intermediate lemma was proved. 
uh, we can see it, you know, we applied a particular rule at a, to a particular part specification of a different uh, result. And I'm going to explain a little bit more uh, about what, what exactly this proof object means and what's happening internally in just a moment. Uh, but as well, in, as well as getting back a data set representation, we could also get back a sort of more human readable thing. So we can request this thing called a proof notebook where it will actually go and synthesize a natural language uh, version of this proof that's, that's formatted as a notebook object that we can then break away and, and do stuff with. So you should you know, note that the input for the rule contains a sub-pattern of the form, blah, blah, blah. Um, but as well as reading the proof, you can also actually run it. So uh, one thing you can do is request back the proof function, which will take, OK, so here we have the axioms and the hypotheses formulated as symbolic pieces of all from language code. And then each substitution lemma, in effect, each, each application of a replacement operation in this proof is then uh, explicitly specified using a kind of map at replace operation applied to an intermediate result. And so then the result of that is you can just uh, take this thing, and we can run it, and we can verify that the theorem was actually true. And so, OK, here's a slightly more interesting theorem in group theory that I'm not going to explain. Hang on, sorry, let me run that. Uh, wait, why is that not evaluating? That's concerning. Hang on, is that working? It's stuck running something. What is it stuck running? Sorry about this. Oh, sorry, I accidentally ran the largest computation in this notebook. But that's OK. There we go. It did actually synthesize something, I think. So we can get back this. Yeah, sorry, I accidentally ran the next example. So I was, I was going to show a simple theorem in group theory. I accidentally, I accidentally ran the next example, which was an open research problem for a long time, which is proving that, uh, th that this is, OK, so this, this here is a specification of, a, of an axiom for, for Boolean logic that was presented by Stephen in, in NKS. Uh, it, it defines the NAND operator or the Sheffer stroke operator. And here we're going to prove that from that, all of the standard algebraic properties of the NAND operation, uh, of the operator still apply. And so this was a, a, an extremely complicated uh, automated derivation. You'll see it took 309 steps, which which is why my notebook froze for a moment, and this is the derivation. Uh, but that didn't take more than a few seconds to, to evaluate once I realized what was going on. OK, so find equational proof uh, will return a proof object if and only if full simplify would have returned, would have evaluated to true for that given equational logic theorem. And uh, as I say, I'll explain a bit more about the internal structure of the proof object in just a moment. And internally, uh, what it's doing is it's implementing a bunch of these algorithmic techniques for doing superposition and calculus and equational logic, things to do with power modulation and Knuth index completion, unfailing completion, and so on. A bunch of algorithms that come from universal algebra, which I'll try and give a very brief explanation of in just a moment. But OK, let me talk about something new that came in version 12. So in addition to a bunch of updates to, to find equational proof, we also released this function called axiomatic theory, which kind of gives you a way of interfacing with find equational proof that's a little bit more user friendly. So the idea is you specify uh, a, a, sort of a specification of a standard axiom system from mathematics, and you get back a, a list containing computable forms of those axioms that can be fed directly into our theorem proving framework. So axiomatic theory, we can, we can request the axioms for Boolean algebra, and we get these back, sort of typeset using, using standard like circle times operators and things like that. We could get back, for instance, the axioms for group theory. We, we store a bunch of metadata for each of these axiomatic theories, so we can request, for instance, the list of super theories. So these are the list of a theories that axiomatic theory knows about that implement group theory as a kind of subset of its axioms. So one of those, for instance, is abelian group theory, because that's just the same, but with the axiom of commutativity. Um, you'll see that we, ha we have this, this default choice of operators. If, you know, multiplication goes to circle times, and uh, the identity goes to one tilde, and so on. If we want to do, we can get back. We can, we can see what that default operator choice is, and we can choose to modify it. So we can, if we pass axiomatic theory a list containing the name of the axiom system, and then an association, we can choose to override the default operator choice. So let's say multiplication goes to g, inverse goes to inv, identity goes to e, and we get back uh, a, a sort of a, a new version of the group theory operator, uh, group theory axioms using our own choice of operators, and we can. Okay, another piece of metadata we could have requested was a list of notable theorems. Uh, so you know that the the inverse of the of the inverse gets you back to the original element, and then if we wanted to, if we if we if we get our overridden our, our version of group theory with our, with our own operator override. Uh, and we request back the notable theorems. Of course, the notable theorems then get uh, rewritten using the new operator choice. And so when, when you do things like modify the choice of operators in axiomatic theory, the function is, is sort of smart enough to know that uh, it, it should propagate those changes down into all of the metadata. And if you then try and prove things about super theories and so on, it will, it will adjust to do that as well. So let's give a quick example of that. Let's use axiomatic theory with, with our new choice of group theory uh, operators. Let's, and let's pick the notable theorem inverse of composite that uh, uh, a, a, a compose B all inverse is equal to B inverse compose A inverse. So let's prove that. 
and we get back a proof object with 19 steps, and so this is the, this is the derivation. And so it's kind of the, the plan is, you know, right now axiomatic theory just has support for equational uh, axiom systems because we currently only have equational theorem proving, but in future versions of the language, as I'll explain in a moment, we're gonna have much more sophisticated theorem proving algorithms. So the, the range of theories that axiomatic theory has access to will, will grow over time, and kind of eventually the plan is to have any kind of reasonable field of pure mathematics represented purely computably in the form of an axiomatic theory uh, uh, sort of entity. So internally, because axiomatic theory is having to do all these non-trivial computations to do with operator overrides and things, it's not actually formatted as an entity store, but you can basically treat it like it's an entity store because it has exactly the same internal kind of syntax. Um, okay, uh, so one point of, uh, w one point that's, that's definitely worth clarifying with find equational proof is what it can't do. So one thing that it definitely can't do is deal with uh, sort of arithmetic operators out of the box. Now, there are very good reasons for doing this. So if, if, if this is a point of confusion when many people first use this function is they try and prove something like, you know, for all x minus minus x equals x, right? That's obviously a theorem that's true in arithmetic, but find equational proof will complain at you if you try and prove it. Um, there are many reasons for this. W one is a very simple reason, which is that uh, on the Wolfram language front end, if you give it a statement like minus minus x equals x, it will just auto evaluate to true. And so find equational proof is then trying to find a proof of the statement true given a set of axioms. But there's actually a deeper reason why we don't support this. We, we could override it, you could put it in hold, hold holders and so on, but the deeper reason why we don't make this work is because the whole point with find equational proof is that you specify the axiom system, you specify the set of assumptions. If you use an arithmetic operator, there isn't a canonical axiomatization, axiomatization of arithmetic. Do you mean some equation, if you use a plus, do you want to use some equational form of arithmetic? Do you want to use piano arithmetic? And if so, which version? Do you use the first order version, the second order version? Do you want to use Presburger arithmetic, something where you have decidability? It's, it's not at all clear. If you use operators that have, well, that have predefined meanings, it's not clear what kind of, what base, what's the correct basis to kind of, to, to start from in doing that. And so maybe once we have access to many more axiomatic systems, we can have some kind of super function that will figure out what a reasonable axiomatization is. But at least for the time being, we think it's safer to kind of let the user define exactly what they want to assume. So if you want to, you can easily prove this theorem, but you have to define your own, your own axioms of arithmetic or use ones that will be built into axiomatic theory. So here, for instance, I'm defining axioms that, that, uh, that sort of specify the plus and minus operations and so on. Uh, so here, here we get back the, the proof object of that. Uh, we get back this data set, which because we've used our own operator choice, gets formatted in a slightly ugly way with these kind of plus and minus uh, operators. But of course, we can, we can always override those and we can use our own uh, choice of typesetting. So we can typeset that a little bit more elegantly there. Okay, so let me now explain what these proof objects really mean, and, and, and to do that, I kind of have to explain a little bit about what find equational proof is doing internally. Um, but we start with the slightly conceptual question of what actually is a proof. Well, from a fundamental kind of meta-mathematical point of view, uh, an, an axiom, particularly an axiom of the form x equals y, for instance, uh, can really be thought of as being a pair of symbolic transformation rules. What it's really saying is that if you have an, if you have an expression that looks like x, you can replace it with one that looks like y and vice versa. And so then a theorem, a, a particularly an equational theorem where you're saying, you know, prove A equals B, is really just the, the statement that there exists some sequence of axiomatic transformations starting from A that, that, that terminates at B. And then, the and then the proof is that particular sequence. And so the problem of theorem proving is to find that sequence of rewrite operations. So, you know, here, is a, here are some examples that actually come from NKS of, you know, here's a proof of commutativity of the NAND operator, uh, given axioms at the top here defining uh, trans symbolic transformation rules. And here you can see where each of these transformation rules is getting applied. Here's a kind of ultimately desiccated form of the same idea. So given this very, very abstract symbolic representation of three axioms at the bottom, here are sort of proofs of, of seven abstract theorems where, you know, each, each symbolic expression is just a sequence of black and white boxes. Okay, but that seems fairly straightforward. So why is theorem proving difficult? Well, at a fundamental level, the reason why theorem proving is hard is because most mathematical axiom systems do not give rise to what are called confluence term rewriting systems. So some, term, so some abstract rewrite systems have this very nice property called confluence or the church rosser property, which loosely speaking says that the, ordering of, the order of application of rewrite rules doesn't matter. You can just apply the rules in any order and the result that you get back is in some sense invariant to that choice. Um, so theorem proving over confluent rewrite systems, particularly ones that, that are strongly normalizing so that any rewrite operation eventually terminates at a normal form, theorem proving in those systems is really, really easy because if you want to prove that x equals y, then what you can do if it's strongly normalizing and confluent is you can just you can apply any random rewrite sequence to x, any random rewrite sequence to y, and then because, this, the, because the system is strongly normalizing, they're guaranteed to terminate on some normal form, and because the system is confluent, it's guaranteed that if they terminate on the same normal form, then the expressions were equivalent, and if they don't, they weren't. So the, problem, the, the, the difficult part of theorem proving is how can we take an arbitrary rewrite system generated by some mathematical axiom system and produce an equivalent one, or 
for some loose definition of equivalence uh, that has this nice property of confluence. So to do that, this is what we, this is the so-called knuth bendix completion algorithm or the, or the unfailing completion algorithm that we use that came from loop theory and, and universal algebra. And the idea is to exploit this property, this uh, result in mathematical logic that says a, a, a term rewriting system is, is confluent if and only if every critical pair converges. So a critical pair is a way of sort of making precise this idea that the, that the order of application of rules matters. So, one, so if you have a non-confluent system, then you could start from, a single, from, a, from an expression A and you could apply, and, and from that expression, you could derive two distinct expressions, B and C. For instance, by applying two different rules in, 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 uh, in different, or, sorry, by, by either applying two different replacement rules or by, by applying the same replacement rule in, with two different part specifications. So a critical pair is basically representing an ambiguity in the, term, in the evolution of the term rewriting system. And so we say that that critical pair converges if given this pair, B, C, if there exists a rewrite sequence that, goes, that takes B to D and a, a rewrite sequence that's a sequence that takes C to D, then we say that critical pair converges to D. And there's this, there's this theorem that says that uh, if, you, if you have a strongly normalizing system, then it's confluent if and only if every one of these critical pairs converges. So all we have to do to, make the, to, to, to do theorem proving, really, is to compute critical pairs and force them to converge. And that's exactly what find equational proof does. It, it, and the way that we do that is very, very simple. We just say, well, if, B, if this pair, B and C, could be derived from a single common expression by applying the rewrite rules, then B and C must be equivalent. So we can treat that like a lemma. We just add a lemma to the system that says B equals C. And when we do that, because of what I explained earlier, we then get a pair of rewrite rules that says B can go to C, C can go to B, and we immediately force that pair to converge. And the idea is if we keep doing that over and over, we keep computing critical pairs, keep adding them as lemmas to the system, eventually we'll end up with something that's confluent. Now, of course, eventually Gödel wins and we get bitten by undecidability, and it's not guaranteed that this process will terminate and you might go on computing critical pairs indefinitely. But actually, in, in most practical cases, this turns out to be sufficient for doing serious theorem proving. So that's. Uh, that's the, the essential idea of how find equivalence, there's a bunch of other stuff that I don't really have time to explain, but I'm happy to address in questions, but that's, the, that's essentially how, how find equational proof works. Okay, so let me now talk a little bit about uh, things to, that are not in version 12, but will be coming in, in version 12.1 and beyond. Actually, I, this is a weird order. Let me, do it, let me do it this way around. So this is something that will be coming in 12.1 we think. Um, so this is support for full first order logic, not restricted to just the equational case. So um, actually, it turns out you can do this just using the kind of algorithmic framework that we already have, basically, because th there exists a, a, a range of these, these techniques, um, the main one of which is this thing called scholarization, which lets us essentially take an arbitrary uh, statement in first order logic. Scholarization then shifts all the quantifiers to one side and gets rid does the quantifier elimination to get rid of all the existential quantifiers. So you just have first you just have universal quantifiers, and then you have a first order logic sort of statement on the right. And then the idea is you can just set that equal to a tautology in Boolean logic, and then that that gives you an equation in Boolean algebra that that's true if and only if the original first order expression was true. Now, it's not quite logical equivalence. It's, something, it's a slightly weaker condition called equisatisfiability, but it turns out to be sufficient for doing theorem proving. So uh, in, in the next version of find equational proof, the idea is for us to have support for, first order, for full first order logic theorem proving using this framework. So here's a very simple uh, sort of syllogism in first order logic proving that Socrates is mortal. Uh, you know, this is, the, this is the proof graph for that. Uh, this is the data set that's probably going to typeset horribly because I just modified the code, but that's, it's not too bad. Um, okay, this is a slightly more complicated thing because it's having to do the quantifier elimination because we have an existential quantifier here. We're saying prove that there exists some x such that x is mortal, and we get a slightly more complicated proof graph. Uh, okay, here's, here's a logic puzzle that comes, from, uh, that comes from Lewis Carroll, actually, I think. So, you know, ev every baby is illogical. Uh, everyone who can manage a crocodile is not despised. Everyone who is illogical is despised. And prove that there does not exist an x such that x is a baby and x can manage a crocodile, right? That's a logic puzzle that might take you a couple of minutes to do if you're a human, but fine equational proof can do it almost immediately, although the proof ends up being somewhat, uh, somewhat non-trivial. Here's an even more complicated logic puzzle. This is the so-called knights and knaves puzzle. Uh, I won't bother to walk you through it, but it turns out Zoe's a knight and Mel is a knave, and fine equational proof can work that out. And again, we get, this, we get this rather complicated proof graph, but because, because uh, equational logic theorem proving is so efficient, uh, this doesn't take very long to synthesize at all. And in fact, this, this turns out to be, uh, in, many, in many cases, much, much faster than doing the equivalent resolution theorem proving over the, f over the full first order logic term, which is why we've chosen this particular approach. There are kind of longer term projects to support higher order logics and resolution theorem proving and first order logic, as well as things like modal logic and temporal logic and so on. But at least for the time being, this is, this is kind of what we've been working on. Um, Oh, I have five minutes left. Okay, so um, 
One other thing that I just wanted to mention that I think what probably won't be in version 12.1, but will be uh, some variant of this will be available in a future version, possibly in 12.2, is a, is a more model theoretic thing. So, so everything I've mentioned so far has been purely syntactical, just reasoning over the terms as syntactical objects. But there's also this whole question of semantics and actually giving interpretations to these terms. So one, one situation is can you, can you find models such that particular theories hold or particular theories are falsified? And one situation where that's really useful is if you, ha if you ask a theorem proving algorithm to prove something that's actually false. So with find equational proof, if we say, uh, you know, find a proof of this theorem, which, is, which can't be, so we can't prove that A equals C on the basis that A equals B, and in this very, very simple case where there's actually only a finite proof tree, uh, find equational proof can just navigate that proof tree and say, okay, I didn't find a proof, it failed. But in the case where there's, there are universal quantifiers and the proof tree is infinite, we can't do that. So here's a false proof in group theory, or uh, here I'm asking to prove a false theorem in group theory, but if I just try and run this, it's going to run forever until I abort it. Uh, or put a time constraint or something. So one thing that would be really nice is to have a way of saying, actually, I found a counterexample to this. And so we have this function that provisionally called find equational counterexample, although the name will probably change, where if I feed in the same specification, it knows that that result is false because it found a counterexample. And the counterexample is this model theoretic thing. So if I get back this association, uh, what it does is it gives an actual semantic interpretation to the terms. It says, here's an actual pure function that denotes this G operator. So it's saying slot one plus slot two modulo two. And it's saying uh, the inverse operation should be uh, modulo, uh, slot one modulo two. And then we give an actual interpretation to the terms so that the identity operator is zero. And the counterexample corresponds to the case where x equals one. And if we want to confirm that that is in fact a counterexample, we can request back the falsification function, which is like like the, the dual of the proof function. So if we now call this sets up of the whole falsification thing, and if we now run this, we get the, we get the, ver the validation that this is indeed a valid counterexample to that result. Okay, so that's a very, there's, as I say, there's a lot more still to come. You know, we, we've really only scratched the surface with, with what we want to do with, with logic and theorem proving here, but uh, I, I hope I've given you at least some indication of, of what we're currently doing and what, what's planned for the future, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. <laughs>